Thank you, Bruce, and good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. There are strabismus, or a misalignment of the eyes, is one of the most common problems pediatric ophthalmologists sees in their practice. So what I'd like to talk about today are some of the terms we use to describe <laughs> strabismus, um, how we measure strabismus, and then some of the more common strabismus conditions. Now, orthophoria um, is the condition in which the eyes are straight. Um, a heterophoria is a, is a deviation of the eyes which occurs only under certain circumstances, fatigue, stress, illness, etc. And then a heterotropia is a manifest deviation, a deviation which is present most of the time. Now, the types of Manifest deviations are esotropia, or a convergent deviation of the eyes, an exotropia, or a divergent deviation of the eyes, and a hypertropia, or a hypotropia, so a vertical deviation of the eyes. Now, there are several ways in which we all measure strabismus. We measure strabismus so we know that it's present, and we know how much strabismus there is, because that can determine how you treat it. So the, the angle kappa, if you look at um, shining a light in someone's eyes, and you notice that the light reflex is centered in each eye, if you look really carefully, even though it is symmetrical in each eye, it's actually slightly nasal to the center, and that's based on the angle kappa, which is the angle between the visual axis, that is the line connecting the fovea, which is the central part of the eye that we use to see with, to the object viewed, to a line that was drawn directly through the cornea and pupil. And usually that angle kappa is slightly nasal to the center of the pupil. And here's just an example, a drawing of what I mean by the angle kappa. And you notice here that the light reflex is slightly nasal to the center. Now, from the angle kappa comes the first way that we measure strabismus, and that's the Hirschberg corneal light reflex. And that's based on the fact that one millimeter of decentration on the cornea equals 15 prism diopters. So here's a diagram, and you notice that the first diagram, that the light reflexes are symmetrical. And that person, that individual, would have had straight eyes. However, you notice that the light reflex is just slightly sent, uh, nasal to the center. And then we notice with increasing amounts of esotropia in this case, that the light reflex in one eye is decentered a greater amount. Now, here's just examples of some esotropia, exotropia, manifest deviations. And you notice that in all of these examples, that the left eye is, is the one that is focusing straight ahead for that particular moment, and that the opposite eye has an eye that turning in, turning out, <coughs> elevating, or depressing. Now, from the corneal light reflex test comes what's called the Kremsky prism test. And that's where we take the deviated eye and take the deviation on the cornea from the corneal light reflex test and center it so it becomes symmetrical with both eyes. And that's by using either loose prisms or a prism bar. So again, we see in, in, in the diagram A a very large esotropia, and you see that the left eye is fixating, the right eye is deviated, and the light reflex is deviated accordingly. And now with increasing amounts of, in this case, base out prism in, in the opposite eye, that it comes to a point where the light reflexes are symmetrical in both eyes. And it's that point that we say 
we know how much the eyes are deviated. And I say eyes always because deviations, most of them are about the two eyes deviating. Now, not at the same time, but it's always a problem of the two eyes not working together. So here's an example of a very large esotropia. And here we, we measure, because in this case, this was the only way that you can really get a measurement in a young, very young child that cannot really cooperate for the next test we're going to talk about, and that's the cover test. So you notice that with the light reflex is centered, and you notice that it's a very large deviation because we had to use a lot of prism to neutralize the de decentration of the light reflex. Now, the third way in which we measure strabismus is the cover test. Now, that requires two things. Number one, a fairly cooperative patient, and number two, reasonably good vision in each eye. If one eye is, has very poor vision, such as amblyopia, which has been discussed, then if my left eye is turning in and I try to cover my right eye and I don't see very well out of my left eye, the left eye may not move straight ahead because it has such poor vision, it just doesn't move. So you need reasonably good vision in each eye and a co fairly cooperative patient to use the cover test properly. So the first thing we do is observe the patient. And you see here in this diagram, in this picture, that the light reflex is actually centered in the, in the pupils. We're now going to place a cover over the left eye, and we're looking to see what movement, if any, occurs in the, in the opposite eye. And in this case, there's no movement. Why? Because the eyes are straight. But you knew that already from the cornea light reflex test. Now you take the cover on the opposite eye, again looking at the uncovered eye to determine whether there is movement. And if there's movement, then there's deviation. So here's a diagram, a very large esotropia. We place an occluder over the fixating eye. The non-fixating eye takes up fixation. It has reasonably good vision, and we know that there is esotropia because of the light reflex, but we also know it from the cover, uncovered tests. Here's an example uh, of an eye, uh, again, um, an eye that's going out and coming in to take up fixation. So now we know that just the cover on cover test that there is movement, and now we'd like to know how much movement there is, how much deviation does that child have. We could have used the cornea light reflex test, but we have a child that's cooperative and has reasonably good vision. So we place increasing amounts of prism over one eye and then go back and forth until there is no longer any movement of the uncovered eye. And then at that point we know how much strabismus there is. Here's an example of a child with a large esotropia. He's fixating at this moment with his right eye. His left eye is turning in. You can notice the light reflex is descended significantly. He's fixating now with his other eye. His, his vision was equal or relatively equal, so he alternated. But you notice the light reflex is decented significantly. So we're going to then place um, an occluder over the left eye. He now is going to take up fixation looking straight ahead. We know that there's an esotropia. We knew it from the cornea light reflex test, and now we're going to just refine it how much it is by the cover on cover test. Again, we place the cover on the opposite eye. The uncovered eye moves out to take up fixation. We now are going to place increasing amounts of prism, in this case a prism bar of increasing amount, to neutralize the movement, and we know how much that eye is deviated. And again, just back and forth until we get it. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of the common strabismus disorders that we see in pediatric ophthalmology. The most common type of deviation in pediatric ophthalmology is esodeviations, or turning in of the eyes. Now, one of the most common problems we see is pseudoesotropia. I think for all of those who see young children, parents come in, they have a child, wide nasal bridge, prominent epicanal folds, um, close-set eyes, 
looking slightly a little bit to the left or the right sometimes, and it certainly looks like those eyes are deviated. And here's an example. This is actually a picture of a former fellow in pediatric ophthalmology who the pediatrician said, look, I know you're starting to be a pediatric ophthalmologist, but why don't you take him to somebody so we can just be sure that his eyes are straight. And here I took this picture many years ago of this child, and I had him looking slightly to his left so that the light reflects, as you can see, is symmetrical in the pupils, but you don't see the same amount, what appears to be the white sclera nasally. And you see that there's what looks like an eye that drifts. Um, but the corneal light reflex was normal. If you could do the cover and cover test, that would be really nice too. Um, but one thing that sometimes, no matter what you tell the parents, they just think that something is not right. So if you explain to them, and perhaps in this example, if you have a cooperative enough child, that you can retract some of the wide bridge of the, the skin, you can show that actually not only is the light reflex symmetrical, but that the, the amount of sclera in reality is the same in both, on both eyes. Now, the first type of true esotropia is congenital esotropia. And that is usually present by six months of age, although you probably, if you're seeing young children, infants, you may well see it by three or four months of age. The angle of deviation is very large and constant. They alternate their fixation very often, so they're using one eye and then they'll switch back and forth. They have cross fixation. So that is they use the right eye to look to the left, the left eye to look to the right. So it looks like two things. It looks like they have a bilateral six nerve palsy, which is very rare in young children, and it looks like they're not really following because the minute they get beyond a certain point, they switch to the other eye. And it's very confusing if you haven't seen a number of these children. Most of them have a, the normal refractive error for, for their age. And what is that? Most children at this age, young children, are mildly far-sighted, hyperopic, and don't wear glasses. And finally, there's often a very strong family history of strabismus. So here you see a child, and this is not going to be confused with, with pseudoesotropia, because under the age of one, most children who have esotropia are going to have a very large and constant esotropia. Not 100%, but a very high percentage of them. And here you see a very large and constant esotropia. In this example, the child is fixating with his left eye. Another child, very large and constant esotropia. Again, just a close-up. In this particular case, it's almost difficult to tell which eye he's focusing with. Here's the cross fixation. He's actually using his, le his right eye to look to the left, his left eye to look to the right, and it looks like he's not really moving his eyes very much and not following very well. And it looks like a bilateral six nerve palsies. <coughs> there are two ways that you can tell that the child can actually move the eyes out. You can cover one eye for a short period of time, and you could demonstrate very quickly that they can move the eye, or abduct, as we call it, or quickly moving the head, um, doll's head maneuver, to get them to, show, get them to show yourself that they actually can move the eyes all the way out. How do you manage congenital esotropia? Well, if they have amblyopia, and that is that they're not really alternating, you can patch them for a very short period of time. If they have a very significant hyperopic or far-sighted correction, you could give it to them and see, with the glasses on, do the eyes straighten out. And if they do, then they wear the glasses. But that's not very common in this particular condition. Now, why do we operate on these children early in life? Why? Over the years, it's been shown that they have a better binocular function. That is, they better chance of using their eyes together and a better chance of, not, of developing fusion. That is, the use of the eyes together. Certainly, it avoids contractures. You know, if I kept my arm in a sling for a long period of time and then said, okay, now it's time to move it, it doesn't move so easily. You keep those eyes in that position for a long period of time, and after a while, you're going to have contractures. And certainly, most of the parents are quite relieved 
because they've had enough people saying things to them in the supermarket, with their friends, that somebody can come and take care of this problem and get that child's eye straight. Malcolm Ming in 1981 is a pediatric ophthalmologist, took about 107, 108 pedi uh, children who had congenital dystrophia from a variety of pediatric ophthalmologists and showed that those children that are operated on under the age of two had the greatest chance of having a successful outcome. But in reality, it's been shown now, you know, that the shorter the duration in which you have a problem, and in this case, congenital dystrophia, the best chance you have of correcting it, just like many other medical problems. So if you have a child who has a large and constant deviation, that child needs to be seen. The second type of ESO deviation is accommodative esotropia. That's a condition that usually develops about age two, two and a half, much more variable, initially intermittent, and not a very as large a deviation, probably half of what you would normally see with congenital esotropia. The angle, and, and it's often associated with a significant amount of farsightedness. So here's a patient who has a much more moderate amount of ESO deviation. You notice here she's fixating with the right eye, the left eye is turned in. You put the glasses on, the eyes straighten out. And as long as the glasses are on, the eyes are straight, that's the way you treat it. And sometimes it's not so easy. You know, in the summer when the ch children go and they take their glasses off to swim and the parents say, could you get those eyes straight? And as long as the eyes are straight with the glass on, that's the way you treat it. Sometimes you put the glasses on and they're straight when they look at distance and you see that they still have a residual deviation at near and that's where many of us will give bifocals. So that's where you may see a child who comes in with glasses on with a bifocal correction. That is really the only time that children wear bifocals by and large. Now, the second type of deviation and common is exodeviations. Now, whereas congenital esotropia is relatively common in, in the whole esodeviation uh, group, congenital exotropia is not as common. And that is characterized by a large and constant exodeviation. The angle of deviation is quite large. And again, many of these children alternate so they don't have amblyopia. And we operate on these children early in life for the same reason that we operate on children with congenital esotropia. Here's a child, very large and constant ESO deviation. He's actually fixating with his right eye in this case. And then he alternates and uses his left eye. So you know he doesn't have amblyopia, but you need to get those eyes straight. Intermittent exotropia. When a parent comes in and says to one of you, I think my child's eye is drifting, always ask, well, which way does it seem to be drifting? And if it's going out, you can get yourself a flashlight, but you're probably not going to pick up intermittent exotropia because most of the time, especially early on, intermittent exotropia is much more commonly seen at a distance. And most pediatric rooms, for instance, are not going to be large enough to have that child fixated at a distance. So if, if a parent says, I think my child's eyes are going out, then it's probably reasonable, especially if it's happening on a relatively common basis, that that child should be evaluated. So initially it happens only at distance. Eventually it, it will happen as near as well. Um, very often parents will notice it when their child, young child is sitting in a high chair and they're standing a few feet away and observe them. Um, over a period of time, it tends to increase in many cases, not all of them, and certainly uh, some of these children, especially as the frequency increases, need to um, uh, have surgery. And the other thing is that about 95% of them close their eye in bright sunlight. So sometimes a child will come in and a parent, a young child, and say, you know, I notice my child's eyes always close, even indoors sometimes. And the first thing I always say, did you ever notice the eye drifting? They look at me like, well, they don't notice it because the eyes close all the time. Um, so sometimes you have to show the parents what the problem is. So here's an example. Patient's looking straight ahead, perfectly straight, but he's looking at a close range. You say, okay, now it's time to look at a distance. Boom. Looks at a distance, and the left eye, in this case, is going out. That's intimate exotropia. And you do need a large enough area at distance very often to pick it up. 
In conclusion, strabismus disorders are one of the most common problems we see in pediatric ophthalmology. ESO deviations are a little bit more common than exo deviations. And I think it's very important to realize that sometimes strabismus, meaning that an eye deviates, is a sign that maybe there's poor vision in that eye. And maybe it's poor vision because the second most common presentation, presentation of retinoblastoma is strabismus. So if you think there possibly is some strabismus, then that child should be seen. Thank you very much.